On the morning of June 30th, 2011, police in Macon, Georgia made a very sinister discovery. The partial remains of a young female were found in a trash can located behind a quiet apartment block. The body parts were swiftly identified as belonging to Lauren Giddings, a 27-year-old law student who had recently gone missing. As the news of the discovery began to circulate throughout the town, an uneasy feeling gripped the residents of Macon. The nervousness of many residents was captured live on TV through news interviews. And nobody seemed more nervous than this man, 25-year-old law student and Lauren's neighbor, Stephen McDaniel. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. Mm -hmm. What about um, in the like the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard, had you seen anything there? Are you okay, sir? I, I think I need to sit down. Okay. As seen in the interview, as soon as Stephen is informed about the discovery of Lauren's body, he begins to completely shut down. His reaction could be perceived by some to be that of a man shocked and saddened by the news. But the reality was much darker. You see, Stephen already knew that Lauren was dead. He knew this because he was the one who killed her. Why? Well, we'll get to that. But let's start at the very beginning. Stephen and Lauren both attended Mercer University's law school in Macon, Georgia. Stephen was a bit of a nerd. He enjoyed playing games like World of Warcraft and occasionally wore chainmail armor while doing so. He was described by some of his peers as socially awkward and even creepy. In fact, his former roommate stated that when meeting someone new, Stephen would usually ask them two questions. The first being, where would you go if there was a zombie invasion? And the second being, if you could plan the perfect murder, how would you do it? The second question probably should have raised a few more eyebrows, considering it's an odd question to ask somebody you've just met. But Stephen was an odd guy, who did odd things, so it was to be expected. On the other hand, Lauren Giddings was anything but odd. In fact, she was the total opposite of Stephen. Lauren was from Maryland, but moved to Macon, Georgia in 2008 to attend law school. She regularly met up with friends, attended a study group at the school library, could often be seen jogging around her apartment complex, and was just an all-round, social, friendly person. She graduated in law school in 2011 at the age of 27 but remained in Macon to study for the Georgia bar exam. It was during her preparation for the bar exam that her life would come to a tragically abrupt end. In mid-June, Lauren informed her family and friends that she would be keeping a low profile for a few weeks to concentrate on her studies. However, on June 29th, when Lauren's sister, Caitlin, noticed the absence of any calls or texts from Lauren for several days, she grew concerned since this was uncommon for her to experience complete radio silence. This forced Caitlin to reach out to Lauren's friends, who also confessed to not hearing from her for several days. This prompted them to visit her apartment. Her car was still parked in the parking lot, but despite her friends banging on her front door, they received no answer. One of her friends, Ashley Morehouse, knew where she kept a spare key, and so she used the key to enter Lauren's property. Upon entering, her friends grew increasingly concerned when they discovered her keys and purse were still inside her apartment. They figured if she had left to go somewhere, she wouldn't have left without taking any money, so they called the police. Upon arrival, authorities confirmed that there didn't appear to be any sign of forced entry, and there were no obvious signs of a struggle taking place. Officers at the scene then sprayed luminol, which is highly sensitive to blood, all over the bathroom floor and walls, which produced a very unsettling sight. 
After applying the chemical, the bathroom looked like a slaughterhouse, and it became apparent that something sinister had occurred there. Following this concerning discovery, police were quick to tape off the crime scene and canvas the area. While searching outside the property, one of the officers reported a foul stench hitting his nose. The smell felt familiar to the cop, and he recognized the odor as that of a rotting corpse. As the officers continued to search the apartment block, they discovered the source of the smell, the torso of a female wrapped inside a sheet that had been dumped inside a trash can. Despite searching the other trash cans, police couldn't find the other body parts. Shortly after discovering the body, Stephen gave this now infamous interview, where he is visibly gobsmacked after being informed by the presenter that the body has been found. He then began to break down on camera. I mean, she... What's going on in your mind right now? Like, what are you thinking? Why would anyone do this? You didn't hear anything? No. You didn't see anybody? I, yeah, I just heard something. Maybe I could have helped. It's okay, don't worry. <laughs> His reaction immediately made him a person of interest to the police. In fact, after seeing the interview, police asked Stephen if they could search his apartment. Initially, he said no, stating he was very protective of his space, but he eventually agreed to allow one officer to search his property. Inside, they found the packaging for a new hacksaw, some female underwear, several flash drives loaded with disturbing content, and a master key for the entire apartment complex. The fact that Stephen had a master key in his possession was a clear red flag to the officers, but what shocked them more was what they found on the flash drives. The video shown was taken by Steven, and it demonstrates him filming through Lauren's apartment window. At this point, it was difficult to entertain anybody else as the perpetrator of this sick and twisted crime. And with each new discovery, Steven's pleas of innocent became less and less believable. As investigators thralled through Steven's computer, they also uncovered a series of shocking blog posts he had made regarding his general hatred of women and his desire to hurt them. It was after this revelation that Stephen was transported to the police station to give an interview, where he gave up almost no information. But back at the crime scene, officers were about to make the most damning discovery yet. By employing the help of cadaver dogs, the authorities were led to the maintenance room of the apartment complex. It was in the maintenance room that the murder weapon was discovered, a hacksaw that matched the packaging in Stephen's apartment. With the murder weapon now discovered, the evidence was damning. However, despite investigators repeatedly grilling Stephen in the interrogation room, he wouldn't confess to the crime that he very obviously committed. Throughout the interrogation footage, Stephen can be observed behaving in an extremely bizarre manner. And you've lived next to Lauren for a long time? Yes. Okay. Do you know where she's at tonight? No. Hmm? No. Have you ever seen her with that dress on? No. You have no idea where she's at? No. Steven, did you hurt that girl? No. Do you know where she's at? No. Would you tell me if you did? Yes. Okay. I didn't do anything. Doesn't matter what you think you did. Doesn't matter, it's what I can prove. Okay. Okay, Mr. Smarty Pants. Hmm? His answers are very flat. He barely moves and his reserved tone of voice starkly contrasts the empathetic persona he portrayed for the cameras during his television interview. 
but despite Detective David Patterson and Detective Carl Fletcher hounding him for hours, he still would not confess. He did, however, admit to something he shouldn't have. Stephen owned up to the fact that he had previously entered a few of his classmates' apartments while they were out and taken condoms from them. This enabled police to arrest him on burglary charges while they gathered enough evidence to prove his involvement in the Lauren Giddings murder. It was during this period that even more disturbing evidence came to light. It's more likely that Stephen had actually entered Lauren's apartment on a number of occasions before committing the crime. According to Lauren's sister, Lauren had previously mentioned that something seemed odd about her apartment. She felt that things had been moved around and someone had been in her apartment without her knowing. Furthermore, investigators discovered that on the evening of June 25, 2011, Lauren had actually sent an email to her boyfriend, David Vandiver, in which she explicitly expressed her belief that an attempted burglary had occurred in her apartment on the night of Thursday, June 23rd. We now know, of course, that this was likely Stephen. On August 2nd, 2011, one month after his arrest, Stephen McDaniel was charged with the murder of Lauren Giddings. After being charged, he still denied any connection to the crime despite the clear evidence stacked against him. However, when prosecutors offered to dismiss his additional charges, he had a change of heart. In April 2014, merely a week before his scheduled trial, Stephen McDaniel finally confessed to the murder and dismemberment of Lauren Giddings. He revealed that he used his master key to enter her apartment on the night of June 26th. Once inside, he watched her sleep for a while. However, a creak in the room startled her awake, making her realize there was an intruder. She yelled at him to leave, but Stephen immediately attacked, strangling her to death. He then put her body in the bathtub and left. The following night, he came back equipped with a hacksaw, dismembering her body and then placing her limbs in various trash cans throughout the area. Her other limbs were already collected by the garbage truck when police arrived and have never been found. In April 2014, Stephen McDaniel was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Four years later, in 2018, Stephen decided he wanted to appeal his sentence. His father, Mark McDaniel, initiated a GoFundMe campaign to gather financial support for the legal costs associated with the appeal. However, the page was swiftly removed. Consequently, Stephen chose to represent himself during his appeal and put forth arguments claiming violations of his constitutional rights. He contended that he had not been granted medical clearance before consenting to searches. His legal research had been intercepted by the district attorney, and his attorneys failed to represent him adequately. He also filed a malpractice complaint against his former attorney, but ultimately, the judge denied his appeal. Stephen McDaniel is currently incarcerated at Hancock State Prison in Georgia. If Stephen had not been apprehended following the murder of Lauren, do you believe he would have escalated to a serial killer? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, check out our video on Richard Lee McNair, the convicted killer who escaped prison and convinced a police officer he was just a jogger.